So, um, yeah, the first set of questions uh, are about Avalon and the Unicorn. So they go a little bit more in the, in the mythological uh, direction. Um, so if we look at um, uh, medieval uh, spirituality, uh, in Western Europe you had the uh, tradition of the Grail. Um, and the Grail is in a way a continuation of an earlier um, a Celtic tradition. So in the uh, Celtic religion people believed that uh, we were all part of the earth, of the earth goddess. And she had uh, a cauldron, so a big pot, which was called the blood cauldron. And everything which died went into the pot and when the time was there um, you would get, they would take you out of the pot again. So they believed in a kind of reincarnation and in between incarnations you were in this cauldron. Um, later this cauldron became identified with the, with the grail, which is of course the blood cauldron of Christ, in which the, uh, the blood of the, of the Messiah was, uh, was caught. Um, the, uh, the legends of the, of the knights who were searching for the grail they originate from, uh, from several Celtic places. Um, so there's places in, uh, in France, in, uh, in, on the coast, near Nantes, and some places also on the, on the German border and in Switzerland. Um, and these stories were very much important also for these Celtic people, these Celtic knights, to uh, kind of reconnect their own spiritual tradition um, with the spiritual tradition of Christianity um, and thus to preserve it. One of the elements in there is, uh, is Avalon, which is literally the apple land. Uh, Avalon is a little bit, uh, can be compared to uh, a kind of Garden of Eden or a paradise. Um, if you look at it historically, people place Avalon at Glastonbury. Um, because this was an island where there were lots of apples or orchards. Um, it's also uh, uh, talked a lot about, about the mists of Avalon because it's close to the sea, so other people think it's more close to Cornwall, um, in which a lot of the, the Grail tradition is also uh, playing out. Um, more importantly, on a spiritual level, Avalon is also called the summer land and um, for people who travel in the astral world uh, the summer land is one of the destinations where um, you can collect to the collective consciousness so it is kind of like uh, the, the, the Akasha Chronicles or but also a place which is very harmonious where there's harmony between humans and animals and animals can talk and trees can talk and everything is alive. All the spirits of the earth are collected there and talking with each other. So in another way, Avalon is also another uh, symbol in a way for the blood cauldron in which everything that once was is reunited in the earth. And the story is of course that uh, King Arthur when he uh, was struck with a mortal wound, was also taken to Avalon um, to be brought back to reincarnate on the earth when he would be needed. And this is a, a story which yeah, is, is very big in Celtic mythology that in a way great heroes uh, never die, they just continue their mission whenever they're called upon by yeah, the higher powers, by the goddess. And then they will take incarnation again. And you see the same actually in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Semitic stories, in the Judeo-Christian Muslim tradition, where they also believe in, uh, in the green prophet who will reincarnate or will return to us uh, when the time is most needed. And many stories have these stories, many uh, cultures have these stories of these great saviors who are in a way, you know, waiting place uh, until they are needed again and they will return to us. One of the important things to be a little bit wary of 
um, is that this whole uh, savior idea has become a kind of hijacked by um, the inventions of a I believe 18th or 19th century American Protestant lady who uh, was thinking about uh, Judgment Day. And she basically postulated out of nowhere that um, God would not send all his plagues and terrible wrath upon the earth and allow the faithful, the cho his chosen people to suffer. Um, so that before Judgment Day um, uh, a savior would be sent to them and the, uh, the pure, the holy people will be taken from the earth. And just a moment. Okay. So that these uh, people will be taken from the earth and uh, thus the only thing you need to do to create a perfect earth is leave everything to God because he will create a perfect earth and you have no power or no role in it. And also in your salvation, um, going up into a higher dimension, being taken away from the, the lower vibrations of the earth is something that God's angels will do, so you need to do nothing. So ultimately this story um, is fabricated to keep people from working on themselves, from uh, working on the world, from uh, taking their responsibility as human beings. So it's very important to realize that this whole uh, mythology about, uh, yeah, uh, in a way, saviors who will come to rescue us, whether they are aliens, as Trunfalo Melchizedek was claiming, or uh, some other things, as the whole 2012 hype was about, uh, that they're all in a way created by dark powers to keep us from evolving spiritually. And these myths are very persistent because it's very nice for people to be saved without having to do anything and to have an all-powerful being which takes care of you. Um, unfortunately for them, uh, spiritual progress, spiritual development is ultimately fair, you get what you work for and if you do not work for it you get nothing. So uh, that's a little sidetrack about Avalon. Uh, so it's a very nice place to visit, it's actually uh, very akin to what in uh, North American shamanism are called the, uh, uh, the eternal hunting grounds also where the greater animal spirits live and they can teach us and work with us um, and also where uh, humans go um, to live in harmony. It's also important to note that even though you have a summer land which is in a way the highest part or the most perfected part of the collective consciousness you also have of course the autumn, the spring and the winter. Um, so these are different parts of the collective consciousness um, but here the harmony is less, uh, the awareness is less. Um, so in these lower parts of the collective consciousness you are more into the, um, yeah, the realm of struggles between egregores, struggles between nations, fights between species uh, and often also the emotions and the personality elements are not yet uh, purified uh, into just pure consciousness and pure spirit as it is in the, in the summer land. So if you do go traveling for Avalon uh, or looking for that holy grail, the blood cauldron, uh, the legends always describe that you will have to face giants and trolls and temptations, um, which are also the lower parts of this collective consciousness which you have to progress through uh, to get into a really pure uh, sight. Um, also the stories in, uh, in the Celtic mythology are very much about perseverance. So as long as you keep on fighting, you keep on going, um, you in a way become purified and thereby your essence becomes reusable in the next incarnation. But if your will is too strong, if your knowledge is too weak, if your power is too weak, uh, then you get lost in these lower levels of the, uh, you know, of the collective consciousness 
and you are not born with a mission or with a goal or a purpose which you can continue you're just born as a yeah as kind of a lost spirit who is just yeah wandering around the earth as you were wandering around the mists of Avalon so that was a very nice question and there we get to the unicorn and the unicorn is in a way very connected to these um, to these legends to these stories um, there was a very famous tapestry the hunting of the unicorn uh, which shows all the different phases of how to catch a unicorn and indeed one of the elements on the tapestry is that you need a maiden so that the unicorn will place his horn uh, and his head in the lap of, of the maiden so that the knights can catch it and kill it um, of course the big question is should knights catch and kill unicorns yes or no and should maidens cooperate with catching such a beast um, the unicorn is is a mythological animal and there are many mythological animals like uh, quattles griffins dragons um, and most of these mythological animals are not so much physically uh, true but they can be symbols for certain types of spirits or powers or they can actually quite accurately represent a type of spirit a type of power which can either originate from our planet or from another planet and i've seen quite a few um, strange creatures uh, yeah, giants, trolls, uh, elves, uh, nymphs, uh, quattles, dragons. Um, unfortunately, I have not personally seen a unicorn yet. So that doesn't mean they don't exist, but it does mean that maybe that I'm not a pure maiden. Um, if the legends hold true. Um, what you see a little bit is that um, uh, this whole tradition of mystical animals uh, existed in pre-Christian times. People believed in all kinds of magical beasts like werewolves and um, hellhounds and God knows what. And as Christianity progressed, they of course uh, declared most of these spirits to be demons or devils. Um, but as also happened to most of the yeah, nature spirits, either they became sainted and they became holy or they became demonic. And well, what they've chosen to do with the unicorn is to say like okay we will make this a angelic being from the celestial world who's attracted to purity and virginity and other christian values um, so the question is of course like how much of it is actually uh, like originally true and how much is like christian twist on the on the unicorn um, what you see is that um, in the uh, like pre-christian cultures there was a great reverence for the for the stag um, so these are uh, the male deer with the antlers on their heads um, also the uh, the masculine god who was the consort of the earth goddess was also called the horned god because he had these antlers and um, these antlers are also described as being on the top of the heads of Moses and of other prophets and spiritual beings. They all have these horns on their head. And these horns are in a way antenna to uh, get these higher vibrations. And if you remember uh, the lesson about the, uh, the cocoon, this is also how you can recognize uh, people who have a west wind who receive this inspiration from these higher worlds they also have these horns or other things in their cocoon um, so they were like in a way uh, these horned people are very much um, prophets or angels or messengers somehow from higher worlds from higher dimensions and uh, of course if you have a uh, vested interest in maintaining the status quo uh, these people are demonized and seen as, as demons and devils who carry horns because the Christian religion in Western Europe became very much uh, secularized and politicized. 
So they wanted to keep actually the, the, the divine spirits and other influences out of society and also out of the church. Um, and um, it is very likely, I think, that the, the, like the worship of the horned god or of the, of the stag um, gave rise to the stories about, about the unicorn. But of course the stag is very much uh, a symbol of intuition. Uh, also very much about protection because the horned god is the one who sacrifices his own life to protect the feminine and uh, this is also very much contrary to uh, the patriarchal Christian system where the woman should be sacrificed not the man um, so it is very likely that they kind of like twisted this or perverted this and that this gave rise to the to the stories of the unicorn um, so I cannot be sure um, because I have never met or seen a unicorn but I think it's very likely that if a unicorn uh, will manifest itself it can either manifest itself in a way as um, in, its, in its Christian guise to be um, a creature of healing, a creature of purity or in a more um, yeah, a stag version which is more uh, about uh, which is more masculine more about the horn which is penetrating but also very much defensive and allowing you to see true illusions and uh, see the reality beyond the veil because this is very much what the what the horns of the horned god are about to see beyond the physical world into the subtle world um, Um, uh, the unicorn um, if you look at the uh, at the rise of the stories uh, more historically it was probably introduced by um, the interpretations of the uh, African rhino um, because there are also stories that uh, for instance that the Emperor of China had a unicorn and that there were unicorns in zoos in zoological gardens in Greece and in uh, uh, the Roman Empire and um, from all likelihood and also from the drawings it is quite close uh, there are drawings which in a way show a rhinoceros being identified as a unicorn there's also drawings which show a giraffe which is being identified as a unicorn um, so probably these animals the giraffe and the rhino gave rise to the image of which was later uh, by artists stylized into the horse-like uh, unicorn so it's kind of probably a convergence between these stories of these animals from uh, yeah which were never seen before from africa and already the existing stories of the horned god coming together um, so definitely also in Roman and Greek times there are, yeah, are not mentions of, of unicorns. It's a later reinterpretation, if you will, of a Greek and Roman manuscripts. Okay. Um, are there any more questions pertaining to the, um, to the stories of the Grail? Or these... Um, the Celtic Christian mythology. I see no questions coming up. So I will move into some shamanic questions now. So I'll just send this message to you question oops that went wrong okay. oh I see somebody was writing okay I'm sorry for interrupting you so is there still a question you would like to place about the unicorn or Avalon or it's okay
So the remark I'm getting here is um, Avalon is in the astral plane. Um, um, yes, it's actually the on the far side, you could say, of the astral plane. Depends a little on how the astral is defined. Um, so if you um, in the in the system I described of the of the like seven heavens, um, like you have the, the the physical, then the ethereal where the life force is, then the astral where your spirit is, and the astral then dissolves in a way or goes over into the collective consciousness. Uh, so you are there still as an individual, but you become more and more part of the collective consciousness of the earth or of your species as you move into uh, closer to Avalon. And uh, as Gurdjieff says, one of the important things is always to have self-remembrance. So it's very easy to, to get lost, to get swallowed up by this bigger place, by this bigger energy and lose your, your consciousness. Uh, so to get to Avalon you need to be, yeah, in a way have a good self-realization so you can go into Avalon without losing consciousness. And yes, you could definitely try to go there. And um, ultimately, according to, uh, to one of my teachers, um, he says that in about a thousand years humanity should progress so far that Yet, like just normal incarnated humans, will have a direct contact with the summer land so that they can live with um, a recollection or an awareness of their purpose. Uh, for what purpose, uh, uh, in a way, they can know what is going on with the collective consciousness of our planet again, and they can be an active participant again in uh, helping the collective consciousness of the planet to grow. And I say again, because it used to be like this about yeah, 6,000 years ago, but we lost that, those capabilities when we started to yeah, develop our ego and our individuality. Uh, so it is really our ego and our sense of individuality which have yeah, separated us from that collective consciousness. And we now need to get so strong a control over our ego and over our individuality that they no longer hinder us in our relationship with this collective consciousness. So, the next question is um, in shamanic healing, on which level does healing take place? Traumas and blockages can be removed, but how does this function exactly? Is this a subconscious level, working with life force, or some combination? Um, it depends a lot on the healing technique used. Um, there are, um, within different shamanic traditions, there are very different uh, healing techniques. Um, so we'll go over a few I've worked with. Um, one of the, the traditions in the uh, West African religion, in the Voodoo, uh, in the Santeria, uh, and also in the uh, North American shamanism, uh, is to uh, be cheval, which basically means that you are like the, the horse and another spirit rides you. So um, you invite a, a spirit, uh, a greater spirit, which can be of another human or of an alien or of an animal to kind of like enter into your body or to move together with your body uh, so that your body is not just having an effect on the physical level you're not just having an effect on the life force level but you're also having an effect on the more subtle energy level and the idea behind this is that your actions should reflect on as many energetic layers as possible so that any action any movement any sound is actually carried by all these different layers and works on all these different levels simultaneously and this makes shamanism such a powerful technique compared to um, yeah imagination or um, uh, mystical techniques or just magical techniques because in shamanism all the powers are 
in a way harmonized, acting in harmony and thereby creating very strong effects. Um, it is possible of course to act as a shaman also without uh, this higher spirit within you. Um, but this is kind of um, difficult because your consciousness will have to stretch over all these different planes and harmonize over all these planes uh, to act like that. So there are stories of course of masters and yogis who can do it without another spirit or deity guiding them. Uh, but for me it is at least a lot easier to ask such a spirit, a god, demigod, to, um, yeah, to act in concert with me and to perform the healing uh, uh, in this manner. Um, so as to how these blockages are removed, um, on a physical level you need to create a disturbance. Um, because the, the, the physical is kind of slow, it tries to keep itself in balance. And often if there is uh, some reason for the physical to be moving, to be shifting, uh, this is very helpful. So uh, vomiting, um, uh, diarrhea, uh, sweating, uh, fever, uh, pain, uh, shaking, um, dancing, these are all things which um, help also to move things from the physical level into an energetic level. Um, on the energetic level there's needed a lot of life force. So if you do a ritual it is very good to do this in nature surrounded by energetic objects which can be stones or blessed objects which also generate a lot of energy. So rituals often take place in a healing space. Some shamans have a a healing room in their in their homes where these energies can be uh, quite strong and can be concentrated and called up in rituals in preparation for the healing so in north american shamanic tradition when a person is very ill often other people will dance and will bring animals and everybody gathers in that place for usually up to four days to build a lot of energy before actually the healing is uh, is attempted, uh, so that the conditions are optimal for that uh, for that healing, and also the gathering of so, so many people and animals, also make sure that a lot of spirits will be present there and at, on hand to help to support the healing process. Um, the removal itself of the of the trauma or the blockages. Uh, can be done in many ways. Uh, often the spirit will simply tear it apart or devour it and thereby it becomes uh, transmuted or it loses integrity and, uh, and falls apart. Um, different types of spirit have different specialties. Um, so if you read books for instance by Ted Andrews they describe very nicely what types of spirits feel inclined to do what types of healing. Um, in other shamanic traditions uh, there's a lot of use of elemental energy. So in some traditions also in like more central African traditions people are buried in the earth. Uh, this is also done in middle America. They put people in caves or in the ground in some way um, so that in a way the, the the person becomes one with the earth again, one with the source again, thereby is nourished and purified and then is in a way reborn into the world. Um, in uh, other traditions they use um, the air. So often they put people on top of a mountain or on a, on a bed outside in a strong wind so that the spirits of the air can bring the energies to the person who uh, and also the bad energies can be taken away by the spirits of the air. And also in these traditions often the shamans will blow diseases out of a person or will blow healthy powers or healthy spirits into the person. So this is much more elemental what they are doing. And of course there is blessings and purifications by water and fire. Um, the baptism by water and fire are well known both in Christian and in uh, the uh, Indian Hindu tradition. Um, 
So there's many ways. Uh, in some traditions also the shaman is not directly involved, but is only involved in uh, calling to the gods or, or, or deities um, and inviting them to go into the body or come out of the body if they're demons of the person who is uh, so afflicted. Um, in general you, you do find that creating a place of power is very useful and uh, maintaining the purity of this place is also uh, highly important in, uh, in shamanic healings. So it is uh, not so much that you work on a subconscious level but rather that all levels of consciousness are integrated in, in working upon the person. Uh, it is important that the person like more or less is open to it or collaborates with it and this collaboration can be helped by destabilizing the person so if they're uncertain what is happening because they're drunk or on drugs or uh, in a trance uh, it can give other powers more unhindered access to that person's energy body um, so this is uh, the function in a way of a lot of uh, psychedelics in healing So the next question is uh, a bit more deep about the same topic. I'll post it here. So cell retrieval is an important part of healing. Can you explain how parts of the soul can be lost and become separated? What events cause this and how? Well. Soul retrieval is one of the things I do have uh, personal experience with, both as a healer and as a, as a patient. <clears throat> so, um, a part of your spirit can be, uh, uh, can be separated, and this can be done as a conscious act. Um, this is a uh, done in the, both the Egyptian tradition and in the Buddhist tradition. Uh, in the Egyptian tradition uh, people created a, a ka, a, a double of themselves, so basically an astral double. And that astral double could visit other people, could relay messages, could observe things, could perform healing, so it was kind of like multitasking. So in a way the, the, the magician would create a clone of him or herself and that clone would independently go about and do its own thing. And sometimes clones were generated for a specific purpose. So the uh, original would in a way transfer part of their power or their essence to the clone. Um, and thereby losing control of it themselves and give, handing control over to the clone. Um, so this is Egyptian tradition. Um, in the uh, it's there were also s different from creating a golem as is in the, in the Jewish tradition which is a construct and mm -hmm. so it is not a construct uh, per se but rather a duplicate of yourself so it's subtle difference but a construct is more programmed it doesn't have your consciousness or a copy of your consciousness it's more simple um, in the um, Buddhist tradition it was more like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So they also create a double of themselves, but rather than to separate it and make it independent, they maintain a connection with it. And this way everything they uh, dislike about themselves, they repress about themselves, they don't want to see about themselves, is pushed into their double and the double becomes like kind of their negative. So everything which you don't like, you don't want to see, you don't want to accept goes into your double. And um, ultimately in shamanic tradition, if you're a Lama, uh, you do this to realize like what parts of you are unconscious or un untransformed. So you can reabsorb them and retransform them. Um, unfortunately, this practice has also become uh, known amongst uh, yeah, um, Western Europeans and Americans who also started to do this and started to get in lots of trouble and even getting killed 
um, because often they um, they repressed a lot more than they were conscious of so that their um, in a way their double is much more powerful much more strong than they are and these doubles often have live in a state of enmity with the person who's repressing them and taking away their freedom to act and they often get into a fight with uh, with them and yeah people are suffering from hauntings from disease from spiritual attacks uh, which are being performed by their own doubles um, so this is when you have a, a conscious uh, splitting so don't create doubles if you have an impure imperfect separation uh, unless you're relatively pure and you can deal with the unpure parts of yourself um, what can also happen is that a person has such a um, like an, an inner crisis that the spirit itself splits apart so this is what happened to me um, I had an incarnation um, in the Spanish Reconquista so this is the uh, war in which the, the Christian uh, Spanish um, fought the, the Islamist and Jewish uh, Spanish people and uh, it was quite a, a bloody war it was very fundamentalist uh, on the Christian side and in this uh, war I, um, I was called upon to do my duty for yeah, um, God and the country and I had to yeah, kill my yeah, fellow Spanish citizens because it was my divine duty to God and in this life I was not very um, very happy with that um, so on the one hand I felt I should do this to protect my family and to serve God and to serve my country but on the other hand I felt I should not do this because yeah they are part of my people I should care for them no matter what the differences are and I should yeah have a loving compassionate attitude so these two parts of my being uh, uh, were yeah very much at odds and when I died um, it became um, impossible in a way to, to in a way be harmonious with these two parts which yeah wanted to follow such a different path one of yeah duty the other of love and compassion um, and I yeah I could not find an incarnation to really merge them um, I could not create a personality which merged merged them both so they incarnated in two separate bodies and uh, like the, 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 the part of me which was very much into the um, yeah into the, the, yeah, the love and the compassion and the caring um, was incarnated and yeah he basically uh, became a family man a community leader uh, a person who was yeah in in favor of human rights but also as a leader felt his responsibility to take care of the weaker ones and uh, well eventually yeah uh, he got uh, actually uh, assassinated and he ended badly but at least he was able to do his thing which he wasn't able to do in uh, in that uh, reconquista incarnation and the other part of my spirit um, uh, basically became uh, uh, yeah rather low level uh, uh, character um, who eventually found employ in the in the armed forces um, as a kind of a, a scout slash uh, 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 yeah assassin sharpshooter um, and was eventually uh, killed by friendly fire basically they mistaked him for the enemy and shot him so both of the lives ended violently but in a way both could now follow their path and could do their thing live their, have the development of their own path of duty and of their path of compassion and then later on they could merge again into one personality who has both of these qualities but yeah it became too difficult in this reconquista situation to yeah to do both parts so this is in a way also multitasking you can split your spirit apart and yeah in the in the same yeah time period have separate incarnations 
or be in different bodies at the same time and then and later merge these parts again. Um, for me this merger was uh, uh, spontaneous but for uh, many people such mergers can also be done via uh, soul retrieval. Um, this is basically a, uh, a relatively mild case which I'm describing. Um, other things which can, uh, which can happen is also that uh, not so much after life but during life already parts of the soul or parts of the spirit are splitting off. And this is usually due to frustration um, because as I said these two parts of my spirit wanted to f follow both a kind of a path of spiritual development and sometimes the life uh, circumstances are such that certain parts which want to develop are very frustrated. So even during life it is possible for that part to separate, to split off from the original uh, being because it feels it cannot grow, it cannot evolve and it is rather being harmed or hurt um, or becoming impure by being in the body or being in such circumstances. Um, it's a kind of like um, you're a doctor, you want to heal people, you want to take care of others and um, yeah, they force you for instance to um, yeah, to uh, experiment on prisoners or um, things like this and this is like the power is used but in such a twisted way that also the power prefers to leave than to stay and become darkened or used for, for wrong purposes or uh, so you can in a way rather than do the wrong thing decide to in a way castrate yourself or amputate a part of yourself so at least it remains pure and intact rather than becoming perverted or twisted uh, due, due to your life experiences. Another way in which uh, parts of the spirit can, uh, can be lost um, is due to theft or fighting. So it is possible in energetic combat to um, cut off uh, or cut out parts of the other person's energy body. So a certain uh, yeah, talents, a certain knowledge can actually be stolen from another person so that they will lose a certain talent or power um, and yeah, have no access to it again. Uh, in many cases such parts of the energy body will regrow if, um, yeah, if there is enough time and energy and the energy body is not harmed too badly. But in certain yeah, t yeah, times it cannot regrow and then the soul retrieval also becomes rather difficult. So in the easy soul retrievals you find that both parts of the spirit want to rejoin and you just need to help them and provide enough energy, power and consciousness to yeah, allow the melding to take place. It is a rather complex ritual I have to say so don't try this unless you know what you're doing. Um, because it can have very profound effects on a person's life and on their life path and on their karma. Um, in a little bit more cases you have to try to get the two parts of the soul to become friendly again, but in the really hard cases it can be that a part of the other person's spirit is trapped or captured or still part of another person's energy body of the person who stole it. And then you have to steal it back before you can reintegrate it into the person or steal it back from another uh, domain or another level because if the other part is big enough to be conscious it can actually start to serve other masters, other gods, other egregores and they will protect it and will not let it reintegrate. Um, so this work of like restoring all these fragments to a whole uh, can be quite challenging in both in finding the parts, in getting them to fit together again. And usually the, the shorter the time uh, uh, which has elapsed before the reintegration the better because due to the different evolutionary paths they become more and more individualized and that makes the individualization makes it 
hard to blend them together again because both parts will have to give up their individuality to merge into a new individual. So also if the ego is very strong, if the self-awareness or self-importance is very strong of either one or both parts, it is very difficult to do. Um, so soul retrievals are very efficient and very easy to do on people who are still very connected to the collective consciousness or to an egregore, but if people are very individualized, um, it works less well and often quite temporarily. So often the original person will reject the, the part of its soul which it has given back and expel it again. Usually within yeah, about three years the person can be back where they started because they are simply unable to accept yeah, that part of their being back. And to take responsibility for taking care of that part of their being because whenever you take back a part of your spirit you have to make sure that part of the spirit doesn't leave again by giving it opportunities to grow, to develop itself, you have to listen to it and often you have to prioritize it so you have to change what you're doing in your life, where your priorities lie also in spiritual development. So soul retrieval itself is one thing which is already difficult but making sure that the person um, keeps that part of their spirit can be at least as challenging or at least as difficult. So it, Often it's good to provide care afterwards to the person who has received a soul retrieval to see them like three months later, half a year later, and then maybe every year to see that the new part of the soul is integrating well. Ah. Okay. Um. I think I'll answer two more questions because time is running. Um, so the next question is what exactly happens when a shaman makes a trance journey? And here the question is to the past to heal a client but you can also make trance journeys in the present or even into the future to heal a client. Um, it depends very much on where you go. Um, so roughly there are, are three areas which you can, uh, which you can visit. Uh, you can go into the, uh, the subconscious of your client. So the, the healer will see a landscape and animals and all kinds of elements which are uh, symbols of um, uh, yeah, the, the, the client's um, yeah, uh, being. So for instance a certain group of mountains can be a chakra, a certain animal there can be a certain talent or a certain power and in a way the shaman acts a little bit like a um, both like an explorer but also as a, as a gardener, as a steward, as a caretaker of the internal world of the client. So you're working with kind of the internal tribe and by traveling around the country you see what is sick, what is wrong, what is unhealthy, what is um, dying or in a bad shape. And by um, working on, uh, on that part in a symbolical manner you're also transforming that part of the energy body. Um, so what you see in the trance journey as a mountain can be a chakra or as a tree uh, can be a certain meridian. And um, these journeys are very useful if the, what's wrong with the client is not something the client is consciously aware of or can consciously deal with. So then you often go into the nether world to yeah, go into this. Uh, inner world. So if you make a journey instead um, to the higher world, um, often you will meet advisors. Um, so these advisors which can be spirits or deities, uh, which can be both yours or from the client or from egregores or from friends of the client or uh, deceased uh, um, yeah, um, healers 
who just have a general interest in helping people or deceased friends of yourself or of the client. Um, so these higher worlds tend to have more of a perspective, not so much on what is the unconscious state or problem with the client, but more on what is the patterns they are caught up in. So what is the, their purpose in life? Why are certain things happening? Uh, what should happen? What should they prepare for? So they provide more insight or understanding or harmonious ways of dealing with certain problems. So they often advise a person like, oh, this relationship is good for you or bad for you, or you should get out of it, or um, you should work with these talents in you because it's, they want to develop or it will be, yeah, that will be your karma now to suffer or be sad. So just accept it, don't fight it. Um, so they give more of a perspective on what is going on with the client rather than changing it directly. If you travel to the to the higher worlds. Um, if you are uh, going to the middle world, you're in a way uh, more looking at the, the client's conscious uh, circumstances. So their job, their house, their family, um, their yeah, friends and um, you can see them in a way as they are or also in a symbolic form. So then also the, the boss and the, the partner and the kids uh, may take on the form of animals or objects but you, can, you may also, also see them in a pure form. Um, and this is very much uh, also a, a journey of awareness but more of recognition of what is going on and also of intervention. So uh, you are making, uh, you are there as an energetic body and the other energetic bodies are also there but on an equal level. So in a way, if you go in the, in the, in the nether world into the subconscious, you are the dominant power. You are the, the boss in a way who is going to re rearrange the nether world. If you go into the upper world, you come there as a student to learn about the life path and you are there to be guided and in the middle world it is often a level of equality and you often try to uh, talk to the other spirits to try to get more mutual understanding so they can live together more in harmony uh, so you're more there as a as a mediator in general or as an explorer uh, to have a look at the situation and to report back to the client like gosh this boss you're having a problem with I could see like she's a real snake or whatever and then the person knows okay I should treat her like a snake and yeah this is my way this is the, the correct attitude I should have so this is um, in the trance journey you can also make a choice how much of your energy you can or will take along uh, and also what guides you take along um, there are many different animals and they can all guide you to their different areas of expertise, to their specialties. Um, so in Trans Journey it's often good to start out with your own personal guide or power animal. And it can be that your personal guide or power animal will transfer you to another one. And for people who are not very um, used to shamanic travelings this can be a little bit confusing because the other animal might eat you or might try to get you to eat it to become one with each other, to melt with you. So if some animal starts to rip you apart and gnaw on your bones this is actually quite friendly normal behavior of uh, yeah, becoming more one, of getting to know each other better. Um, so it's nothing to worry about or to get stressed about because um, in yeah, the Christian culture, we've gotten this real drama about death and sacrifice and things like this. But in shamanic worlds, there is no death, there is just reincarnation. And there is no sacrifice, there is just eating and being eaten, which is normal to all beings. Um, so they won't understand you if you're like trying to preserve your life or to fight them off or whatever. 
because then you are rejecting the natural cycle itself which to them is completely weird and alien and how can anybody do that but well Christian people have that tendency um, so this can make yeah such a Western society background rather problematic because we cannot accept our own death or our own transformation as part of our process um, so after such an animal has eaten you it or uh, is riding you or you are riding it it can take you and show you uh, different parts um, the trend journey can be done with just the astral body but you can also bring life force along um, if the more of the energy you take into your trance journey uh, the heavier the hit will be for your physical body so um, in general it is not advisable to make very big or very far or deep trance journeys which require a lot of energy uh, too often so in general I say to people don't trance journey more than twice a day and if you're making big healing trance journeys don't do it more often than once a week because your own energy body uh, if your spirit leaves it so even if in a light trance journey your own energy body becomes a little bit chaotic because there's no more guidance uh, to harmonize it so when you your spirit returns it has to reharmonize your energy body your physical body so it always takes some energy out of you even though on the other levels you can absorb some energy it is not the same energy as the energy you need here so your life force is depleted even though your spiritual energy may be increased by trans journeys um, so that's a bit of a, a trade-off because often in a trans journey you're trading lower energies for higher energies um, and the deeper you go and the more energy you take out of your physical body the more effects you can have and the farther you can go into deeper and deeper worlds or higher and higher dimensions but there is always a price to be paid um, so uh, you can compensate this a little bit by giving your physical body in care uh, to another being or to another spirit who can harmonize it and take care of it while you're gone so uh, if you have uh, uh, for instance uh, a trench journey and your own uh, spirit guide or your own power animal doesn't need to go with you then maybe it can incarnate into your body so to keep your own energy stable another method is to do trench journeys in a cave or while lying flat on the ground and merging your energy body with that of the earth so you give your body back to the earth so the earth itself can maintain your uh, your physical body and your energy bodies while your own spirit is out traveling so in these ways the impact of trans journeys can be minimized so um, that's brings us to the last question I will answer for today. So what are areas of caution in shamanic healings and what should you be careful with in healings? Okay, it's a rather bad translation. I apologize because the question was in Dutch and was a bit in a hurry. Uh, shaman is very open to spirits, is this not dangerous? Well, um, the thing for a shaman is that uh, depending on the tradition they work with, it is either about, um, it is always about respect. And as long as there is enough respect, there is actually never a problem. If there is some disrespect or some contention, then there can be problems. Um, so if I'm in a kind of like a cold stream shamanism it is very much about superiority I am superior to certain beings and inferior to other beings and as long as I accept my position and I don't try to rebel against higher beings and I um, yeah treat the lower beings as I should treat them I guide them I protect them I take care of them and there is not a problem between me and those beings um, 
one of the, the problems is that many yeah, neo shamans, modern shamans, um, they see shamanism like a candy store and they can just take or pilfer whatever they want. And they act without respect. They know a little bit, like, okay, this power, uh, this animal has that power, this stone has that power, that stone has that power, and I need it for my healing or to, to do this with or to do that with. And if you go into that without the proper respect or without uh, or mistaking the relationship, maybe some power you think you can use is actually greater than you and you should offer yourself as a servant to it rather than try to use it. And then you can get into trouble with these spirits because they will yeah, not accept uh, your mistake and they will not accept your disrespectful behavior. Um, and this can lead to power struggles between uh, the shaman and the powers and the animals and the spirits rather than cooperation. Um, so there is very much uh, options for, uh, for the dark cosmos uh, or for black magicians to work with shamanic techniques because you can enslave other spirits also just as well as you can cooperate with them. Um, and not all shamans and not all powers are also um, in that uh, yeah, cooperation mode anymore. Because certain animals are very abused animals, certain plants are very abused plants. Uh, so their relationship between the plant and humans in general, or humanity, uh, has been disturbed. And from the perspective of a plant or uh, an animal, one human is just like the, like the other human. And uh, if you show up, you might be attacked. By, uh, by those plants or those stones or whatever, depending on the history that place has with humans. So often in places where there has been a lot of, uh, of mining or oil drilling or gas uh, boring um, um, or mineral mining, the earth will feel very aggressive towards humans because they will feel that humans are destroyers of its energy body and violators of its integrity and disrespectful beings. Uh, in the same way, if there are certain plants which are being uh, grown agriculturally, um, they're often also not being uh, allowed to live full lives or to grow to their full potential or to interact with other plants. So, in general, agriculturally grown plants tend also to be more aggressive uh, towards humans than uh, plants which are, in a way, in the wild or, in a way, almost useless. Uh, but also spiritual plants like um, the ayahuasca or the peyote or uh, marijuana, uh, they're abused so much that they uh, eventually become very aggressive towards humans, even though their purpose is to be used in shamanism. There is so much recreational use and abuse within shamanism that the relationship between the power and humanity uh, becomes corrupted. And in this way, the, yeah, the persons who uh, abuse shamanism or use it in the dark magical way or in the dark cosmos way are removing resources from the human race for their spiritual development. Um, so it is very important for the shamans in the lighter tradition to try to restore these relationships between humanity and other species and other kinds of spirit. Um, other areas of problem can be about um, uh, territory. In a way, um, shamans are very territorial, just like animals are territorial. So, for instance, if a person is my student or if I have worked on them as a healer, um, shaman might not take kindly to it to another person also trying to heal that person or try to heal a person or working within what they see as their city or their forest and uh, often they will instruct other spirits to 
uh, attack intruders or um, they might also directly in attack the shaman who is messing with their work or their client or their human. Um, so territory can be claimed geographically but also uh, more precisely so some shamans are just the shamans of the stones within their territory or of the humans or of the dogs or the cats or the horses within their, that territory and they don't care what other people are doing so whenever you before you start working you should try to look for traces are there other shamans and if yes what is their domain what is their territory and of course you can fight them for territory you can go into struggle with them and you can reset the boundaries so that you have some living space and this resetting of the boundaries can be done in a pretty friendly way but um, shamanism is often uh, at least about po about posturing just like animals you know, like the bear will make itself large and roar and roar and, and different animals have all kinds of posturing behavior so it often requires a show of strength a show of capacity a show of ability to, for the other person to determine and for you to determine what are areas of expertise which are best left to the other and which are areas of expertise where I am stronger. So in this way, out of, uh, in a way, realizing your potential and realizing the potential of the other shaman, it becomes clear what is the ideal uh, way of taking care of uh, the world together. Um, also there are just uh, general warnings um, when you're uh, yeah, working with spirits you should make sure that the right spirits are there so always uh, yeah, work in a holy space if possible uh, start with a ritual uh, purifying yourself purifying the space purifying the client uh, before opening up to spirits um, and don't call on spirits if you are vulnerable, if you are yourself sick or unbalanced because this makes it very, very easy for your enemies to attack you. Um, so this is just general advice. But uh, more importantly also as a shaman uh, you should have some warrior qualities. You should have uh, stability and ability to control yourself and you should have dominance of your own energy body so you should not have to fear any spirit or any intrusion because if you cannot defend yourself then you should not be in shamanism um, it's as clear as that because there's always spirits of deceased people who are looking to incarnate or spirits who want to use you as a puppet and if you're unable to guide yourself shamanism is not safe for you it's, if you're unable to guide yourself, the world is not safe for you. You could better say. Shamanism is a very good foundation in learning uh, self-control, in learning how to control your ego, how to control your energy body, to become aware of your talents. Uh, shamanism is very much the tradition of the first and the second uh, messiah of light, learning you to develop your strength, use your strength, um, overcome your own natural tendencies and to work in harmony with uh, all other beings and in servitude to all other beings and in return all other beings will seek to work in harmony and servitude to you. So it's very much a tradition of cooperation but a cooperation which is very much based on respect, uh, strength, skill um, so it's not all about love um, it's just like the natural world, it is tough, but it also creates a very rapid evolution um, of, uh, of power, of skill, of insight. So it's a very good tradition to begin with in your spiritual life, um, because it's a foundation for all other work. Um, other areas of caution are especially in dealing with uh, with metals, with symbols, uh, with insect spirits um, because shamanism in itself is working with cycles uh, cycles of life and rebirth, masculine and feminine and um, allowing energies to flow 
and everything which stagnates energies is in a way uh, yeah, an anathema. It is an enemy to the shamanic tradition. So if you start working with very much fixed ideals, like this is perfection, this is the perfect world, this is purity, um, and uh, then it doesn't work well with the shamanic tradition. And these spirits who try to, in a way, freeze humanity to halt all progress and to separate like male from female, low energies from high energies, as in a way is happening within uh, uh, sometimes the Sunni tradition and Protestant tradition where they try to remove uh, all the saints. So you don't have a, a continuous ladder of progression anymore, but you have God on a very high place and us in a very low place. Um, these traditions are uh, yeah, very aggressive towards the shamans and shamanism. Um, and also um, alien powers which are related to insects or insectoids, which are also very mechanical in nature, uh, very fixed in nature, uh, structured in nature, uh, also problematic and also, yeah, in a way, jobs in government agencies and bureaucracies are yeah are also very much in this insectoid influence in this yeah static rule based uh, system uh, and for shamanism it's very much about creativity doing everything in a new way finding new patterns uh, creating new life creating new progress and book learning repetition learning by rote and regurgitating knowledge is uh, completely opposite tradition so those things don't blend well um, so those are things to be careful with and often these in your trans journeys uh, you will see them as uh, metals or insects um, uh, in a way in the if you connect it to the school tradition the larva are also uh, very much symptoms of people getting stuck in their emotions instead of, uh, or their, their, their ideals, instead of moving through and using them and them transforming all the, all the while. Um, so those enemies might attack you if you uh, try to work in shamanic tradition. Okay, so yeah, that's only a few of the 19 questions uh, I had today. Um, but I hope it uh, has been uh, useful for you. So are there any questions about the topics we talked about? Is a sensual one with the text? Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing your question. Did you put it here on Skype? Yes, uh, through Skype. Uh, I'm not seeing it. Could you send it again? Or otherwise read it to me again? I will read it because if I send it again it says outstand, so I'm not sure what's happening. Okay. Um, I had a question about the similarities of soul retrieval and uh, the shadow side. Mm -hmm. uh, shadow side, I mean, schaduw comes in Dutch. The things of your personality that you won't uh, yeah, give space or room. Um, can you see or can you elaborate on the differences and similarities between uh, retrieving part of your soul and, um, yeah. Uh, Working with the shadow side, yes. Integrating your shadow yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, it is, it is very much the same work. Uh, the difference is, do you do it before or, or after? So if in your life you work with your, with your shadow side, with your subconscious, or in shamanic tradition this is called uh, working with your inner tribe, um, you prevent those parts splitting off from you. Uh, there's always parts of you which are more, um, uh, yeah, which get more uh, to the foreground, also depending on what phase you are in life, you are developing different talents. And often 
there are always parts of you which are frustrated. By working with your shadow side you can try to appease those sides or at least become aware of it or plan like gosh maybe when I'm retired or when I'm on holiday I will spend some time working with those parts of my being or developing those talents and you prevent them from, uh, from separation. And it's much better to try to prevent them than to try to re-merge them. Um, because once they become separated, they are also free to act without you. And they are not very likely to, be, um, to choose to be frustrated again just to be with you. So uh, they may be more simple, less powerful, but they are free. <laughs> and often they choose freedom over, over power. Because then they think like, okay, so I can be free and have little power or I can be slave of this huge empire, which is the, 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 the total personality. But if nobody's listening to me, I'm a slave. It's not a democracy. And this is very much also what you should, uh, should strive for in working with your shadow side, to be a true democracy and give all the powers and uh, facets of your own personality a chance to be heard and then uh, have an open uh, discussion, open conversation with all these parts and collectively try to find what is the best thing to do, what is the right path uh, or what are the right transformations to, uh, to follow, to implement. Um, and by doing this in a democratic fashion uh, you can prevent yourself from splitting up. And also if you already have this attitude towards these other parts of your being, then a soul retrieval will be much easier. And also certain parts of your soul might also spontaneously uh, like, try to um, reintegrate with you because they feel that now it is, it is better to be part of you than to be separated. Uh, so the success or the ease of the soul retrieval is very much dependent on how well uh, the person is dealing with themselves, how uh, dictatorial they are. And often uh, one of the biggest blockages is, uh, uh, is morality. Uh, people who have a very strong moral standpoint towards themselves, like, okay, um, these qualities in me are sinful or they're of the devil or evil or whatever, they often are very um, frustrating those parts of their being and those parts of their being are often becoming corrupted or perverted or lead to also perversions in, in action, in interest, in thought, in emotion uh, because of their frustration. And um, the, uh, through this process of perversion also uh, they go into a lower vibration and they get more power over you and to get a perverted part of the being to become a whole part again or become a light part again uh, is very difficult it's very hard to do so it is very important to try to prevent that so to to uh, be in control of yourself but also be in a gentle control like a mother trying to guide yourself rather than as a dictator who is repressing certain parts of your being. Because we all have lust, we all have aggression, um, we all have desires um, for power, for money, for influence, for dominance. These are just natural instincts. Um, but if we work with them, then they also don't get perverted and there's also no reason uh, to, uh, to try to block them. And this is kind of like the negative spiral uh, we can get into. So for instance if my uh, uh, I don't deal with my aggression very well so I become a very abusive person I don't know I steal candy from babies I beat up uh, women I beat children uh, uh, I kick animals uh, whatever and then I realize gosh this is bad this is evil and I start repressing my aggression even more uh, that just makes it worse. So repression is not an answer. Uh, it is about sublimation, about cr creating lighter and lighter outlets for the same impulse. So if I have this aggression and I have this tendency to, I don't know, kick animals, 
uh, then it would be good to say like okay I have to accept that this aggression is there what is one step up from kicking animals okay maybe I should yell at them instead of physically abuse them and when you're yelling at them then you can say like okay well instead of just yelling at them and thereby also upsetting them well maybe I could um, yeah, try to, to teach them or lecture them instead, try to give them insight and well, instead of just pushing my views upon them, uh, well maybe the next step up is to, to try to guide them, like to see the good in them and to help them to develop that and to complement them. And so slowly but surely you can crawl out of these perverted tendencies and to transform them. But this is a process where really the personality has to go through really big changes and these like often can take 10 years or more for even one preferred tendency to become transformed so it's a very hard process and it's very important in a way to try to prevent that also as a society to try to prevent um, uh, those things but also to uh, to encourage uh, the, the transformation of these lower vibrations these perverted vibrations into higher vibrations and i find that in society this is not done a lot because society is also very much focused on uh, time pressure stress uh, effectiveness uh, things have to produce quick results and if things have to be effective and produce quick results then generally uh, using lower vibrations is seen as preferable to using higher vibrations so instead of like for instance training my employee to to have the right behavior if i uh, shout at them or yell at them or kick them out and hire somebody else this has quicker results and this is rewarded by society and in a way society is in a way um, unfortunately um, making our vibration lower uh, because yeah, we're not placing human development at the center but rather yeah, money, effectiveness and power at the center. So in a way the, the sickness of society is transformed into personal psychological sicknesses. Um, you can also see this back if you look at uh, the uh, genetically. Uh, basically all yeah, humans they have different uh, uh, yeah, spiritual diseases um, so different rates of depression or murder or schizophrenia but roughly the, the mental health is, is the same worldwide uh, but for instance serial killers are a uni uniquely Caucasian thing it must be genetic somewhere but if you look at the uh, how often a person has a tendency develops into a mental illness how severe the mental illness is and how long it lasts you see that in our modern western society it happens more often the symptoms are more severe and recovery is more slow than it is in so-called primitive societies which are more open less pressure and more humane uh, where the, the yeah it's about humans and not about systems so in a way our yeah uh, the, the, the yeah, moving backwards, spiritually speaking, of our society is also creating a similar motion in our uh, energy bodies and also this is reflected in our, our mental health. Okay, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, <laughs> thank okay. you. <laughs> and uh, to elaborate on that from a psychological viewpoint, point, if you see uh, people uh, doing little things of self-sabotage in work or in uh, um, um, uh, contact with other people, mm -hmm. um, is that also a bit like a signal that you uh, are dealing with oppression of yeah uh, one of your viewpoints or your personality yes yeah yeah often self-sabotage or fear of failure or fear of power fear of responsibility um, often has to do with with also past life traumas and um, it, it's often due to a lack of faith a lack of trust in in themselves um, because they don't trust themselves with 
uh, with that power or that position uh, or they, they think they're not ready yet or it is too much of a hassle, too much of a problem or they feel they will lose too much freedom if they take up something. Um, so often they don't believe in their capability of integrating that part well into their, into their life or into their life path. Um, and this um, lack of self-confidence is often also due to like inner struggles uh, so that there's disharmony in the inner tribe which is keeping them from reaching their full potential um, and the other option is that it can be vengeful spirits because if you have done things wrong with a certain power or a certain talent in a previous life it can be that you deny this power or talent to yourself because you don't trust yourself but it can also be that it is karmatically denied to you by higher powers or it can be that uh, vengeful spirits who were your victims in your previous life are preventing you from doing it again uh, so and all these things can manifest themselves as uh, self-sabotage um, what is another possibility is that also you have uh, a painful experience which is related to that and by uh, trying to uh, you're trying to avoid the pain by avoiding yourself from going in a similar circumstance um, so for instance if like in, an, in, a, in a previous incarnation you were a leader and everybody you were leading died horribly then it can be like you don't want to feel that pain again of losing them or disappointing them or failing again and because of this pain uh, you are not allowing your leadership qualities to come forward again or actually fear of this pain uh, you don't want to re-experience it or you're afraid you will feel it again or it will happen to you again and often this uh, yeah, fear can freeze people into a certain niche so it is very important to always um, to make spiritual progress to be fearless and to see it from the perspective of your spirit because as an as an individual of course like if you're like a leader or you're you have a family and everybody gets killed or you lose them or you get betrayed uh, this is a horrible thing but from a higher perspective as your spirit everything is just a learning experience everything is just a chance to develop yourself to learn from it to do it better next time and this constructive positive attitude of the spirit um, has to be reflected in the incarnated personality because these lower powers the things which happen try to shape you uh, and your spirit is also trying to shape you and the more power you give to your past and to your your environment the less power your spirit has over you and the more uh, frozen and controlled you will become by your past and by the people around you and by the circumstances around you uh, so it's very important to uh, to be independent to say like okay my spirit is strong I can do everything I want to do and it can be that the circumstances are wrong or bad and that will make it more difficult but I am free to do what I want to do. I don't need other people to, to help me or to support me or to allow me. Uh, because this is, these are often fear-based patterns or ego-based patterns uh, which can hamper your spiritual development. Thanks. Okay. Are there any more um, questions? Well, then uh, I'll sign off for, uh, for this week. Um, I'm, uh, I hope I will be able to do it next month. Um, at the moment I'm suffering from Lyme's disease again and it's getting a bit worse because I can't take medication because they're going to test me again by the end of July. So it can be that yeah, for the next two months I won't be able to uh, yeah, to be clear enough to answer questions but uh, I hope I'll be okay and we'll just see how it goes 
but um, yeah, I'm just planning to uh, yeah to speak again on the first uh, thir uh, Thursday again in June, which is uh, Thursday the third of June. So okay, thank you all for the questions and for uh, for listening, and I will uh, post this again with the link. I think you mean July. Uh, July, uh, yes, July. Yeah. Yes, third of um, July. <laughs> good luck with the medication, Hanko. Okay, thank you. <laughs>